Mother Nature is scary, but with a better understanding of her temperament and the factors that are important to pay attention to, we can make better flying decisions all around. So welcome to part two of this video series where we're gonna go more in depth on flying in the more sketchy locations like the beach and the mountains. We are also going to zoom out to get a bigger picture on weather patterns as a whole, what they resemble, and how to plan your trip to the Corona Arch in Utah with this bigger weather picture in mind. And at the end of the video, I'm gonna go into the resources that you have access to that'll help you plan this type of trip. If I have done my job correctly, at the end of this video, you're going to have a better clue as to what the weatherman is talking about when it comes to a cold front moving through or a warm front coming through, specifically as it pertains to flying paramotors. If this all sounds good to you, go ahead and hunt for that like and subscribe button. Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the content. So the wind being the number one factor that we wanna pay attention to, let's go ahead and go into how the terrain actually affects the wind and why we need to pay attention to it as paramotor pilots. Back to my favorite river analogy, if we observe a rock in the middle of a river, we can see how the fluid dynamics is affected by that object in the water. Finding the parallel to this analogy, we know that any building or tree or any obstacle really upwind of us is going to be affecting the air flowing over and around it. This is known as rotor, mechanical turbulence, and in the case of really big objects, it also has the effect of wind shadow or just creating an absolute dead zone behind the object. The obvious question to ask here is, where am I safe downwind of these objects? Well, there's an equation that has been mapped out by people that are smarter than myself, where they take the height of the object multiplied by the speed of the wind, and that gives you the minimum safe distance away from the object. Object. Again, this is a minimum. So let's take a realistic example here for this equation. Let's say that your intended flying field has 50 foot trees bordering the field. With a steady eight mile per hour wind, we would wanna be 400 feet away from those trees, leaving the ground and climbing out to stay clear of any wash happening over those trees. So these thresholds are conservative and it's not going to be a death sentence for you if you're flying into rotor caused by a four or five mile per hour winds. And this is a big part of the goal behind this channel is knowing the risks and accepting the risks going into a situation because that is two-thirds of the battle when avoiding catastrophe. And I really like the quote from our sports grandfather, Wilbur Wright, who famously said that carelessness and overconfidence are usually far more dangerous than deliberately accepted risk. If you support this message and wanna help spread the word, go ahead and head on over to my Patreon where you can support the production of this very video, just like these legends do right here. Thank you guys 100 times. So with the concept of mechanical turbulence better understood, let's go ahead and talk more about flying in mountainous terrain. The common sense rule of thumb is to just be upwind of those mountains. If you've got peaks to the east, you better be west if the wind is coming from that direction. In this video right here, I'm flying over these jagged peaks every which way because I have zero wind gusting zero. Knowing your wind speed and making sure that the forecast doesn't predict something to pop up suddenly is key. Understand that conditions can be very unpredictable and always carry a second chance with you in the form of a reserve. Along with bigger objects like mountain peaks, you'll have what's called wind shadow or dead zones where wind is not able to reach due to the blocking windward face of a slope. These zones, however, are very close to the leeward side and are very unpredictable and very unstable. I personally have been suckered into conditions that I thought were great because I didn't do my due diligence in looking at the forecast. When I checked the weather app after the flight, kind of backwards, it said that the conditions were blowing about seven miles per hour. But the wind was coming from the west over these eastern facing slopes, but not able to reach where I was immediately right in the leeward side. Shortly after takeoff, I noticed that I wasn't really climbing at all, but that's because air was flowing up, over, and down on top of me, pushing me down slightly. It wasn't catastrophic, but it could have been. Give the weather app the benefit of the doubt when flying in the mountains. If it says it's blowing seven miles per hour, but you don't feel it, there's a good chance that you will at some point. Another factor making flying in the mountains fairly unpredictable and unstable is the sun heating the ground in uneven ways. You'll have faces that are totally shadowed while others are getting baked by the sun. Whenever you've got a temperature difference, you've got flow happening from the cool air to the warm air. We do not want to fly when the sun is causing any sort of convection while in the mountains, unless you know what you're doing and you're accepting that risk. The last 
point I wanna make about flying in the mountains is the high density altitude. And high refers to the altitude, not the density. It's kind of confusing, but high density altitude means that you've got thinner air to get you off the ground and keep you there. This thinner air means that your motor is not creating as much power because it's got less air and therefore less fuel to mix with that air to keep the mixture correct. So your motor is generating less power, your propeller is not spinning as powerfully therefore, it's not pushing as much air molecules as you are used to it pushing. On top of this, your unacclimated body, if you're coming from a place like sea level, is not used to running in these conditions. So your lungs aren't producing the same amount of oxygen that that's keeping your legs energized. And the cherry on top is the fact that the wing doesn't want to pick you up like it will at sea level. This kind of earns the adventure wingman a new level of respect for launching equipment that weighs as much as they do at 7,000 feet MSL without wheels. So if or when you do get off the ground, you should expect a faster baseline airspeed. And whenever you're in a bank, a much quicker descent rate than what you might be used to. For this reason, you've got to be careful up here. Sadly, a number of pilots have taken their last flight up here at altitude because they're doing sea level maneuvers while still being too low to the ground for this high density altitude. This is because there is less air hitting the leading edge of your wing to slow you down. As you're doing this wing over down low to the ground, there's less air to slow you down and pitch you forward through that maneuver and pilots will end up miscalculating and having their trajectory end up with them in the dirt. There's no such thing as too much altitude, guys. If you're in an unfamiliar location at an altitude that you know is higher than you're normally flying, please go up higher to get used to this new environment and just experiment up there. On the exact opposite of the geological spectrum, let's talk about beach flying. But with the ocean producing no convective action and being perfectly flat, the ocean provides really nice smooth laminar flow for an aspiring beach bum such as yourself. It's one of the more unique and fun locations to fly as you can pretty much fly all day long, but there are some things you need to be aware of. Rule number one about beach flying is that you must have an onshore breeze. All right, so we got the ocean over here and we've got land right here. Over the land, we've got convective action happening. This creates a low pressure zone from a microclimate perspective. So the high pressure over the water is moving to replace the low pressure air that is getting lifted up as that low pressure air is being lifted, it's now cooling, becoming more dense, turning into high pressure, and replacing the high pressure air that was flowing to low pressure, and so the cycle continues. But it is imperative to have the expectation that this cycle can turn the other direction fairly abruptly for a couple different reasons. The main reason is that the sun starts to set, and now the convective action that was happening over the land is allowed to fall back down, creating a now offshore breeze. And this can happen fairly abruptly. So when the heat of the day is done, you wanna be very aware that that convective action can reverse the flow and push you out to sea. At any point, if you're flying at the beach and you notice that the wind stops, it's likely that convection over the land is done happening and it's about to change directions on you fairly quickly. So land immediately if your wind stops. Another thing that you wanna be mindful of if you're flying in a place like Florida or someplace tropical, you can have isolated cells that are mature. In other words, they're developing and decaying at the same time, kind of like grandpa at the gym. These cells can push an isolated channel of air out to sea, even during the convective period of the day. I believe this was a big part of the inspiration behind Project Water Landing, a series that Team Fly Halo did to test different water landing techniques and flotation. It's a great series, and if you haven't seen it already, definitely go check that out. On that note, please have a second chance in the form of flotation, guys. It's not guaranteed to work, so don't don't fly recklessly just because you've got flotation on, but it can save your life, so it's cheap insurance. Get flotation if you're flying at the beach, please. As far as where you actually fly at the beach, we wanna be mindful that we're not too far over the land because we've got the convective action happening, but we also don't wanna to be too far out over the sea in case that motor quits. I adopt a one-to-one -one glide slope when flying over the water, meaning that if I'm 20 feet out, I'm 20 feet up. This gives me plenty of margin to get back over the sand and land safely into the wind if my motor does die. So this pretty much sums up the two extremes of our flying location. But if you do wanna know more about choosing the right flying days for a location somewhere in between these extremes, check out this video right here. All right, let's go ahead and move into part two of this video where we're gonna talk about weather patterns and what they mean for our beloved flying forecasts. Weather fronts. 
If they are around, you shouldn't be. But let's talk about the four types and what they mean for the near future. So with a cold front, it refers to the leading edge of a cooler air mass passing through an area. You can expect the temperature and moisture content in the air to drop significantly. These fronts represent a wedge passing over the earth. Warmer air is getting picked up and forced to condense and drop its load. This is where you can get a frontal storm line that can be very aggressive. And as I mentioned in my last video, it can cause some very strong winds from very far away. The good news about cold fronts, however, is that once they pass, you're in a high pressure zone, generally speaking. And with this comes high pressure air or low density altitude air that will make flying nice and smooth and easy. Warm fronts carry a lot of the same ailments, but these air masses are moving a little bit slower. But the same principle applies. As a warm front is overcoming a cooler mass of air, any moisture in that warm air mass is forced upwards, condenses, and then drops. So it is very possible to get rain showers and storms along that warm front, but winds are typically not as aggressive. We've watched the Weather Channel enough to know that once that warm air passes, we can expect warmer temperatures in general. But now with warmer air comes increased humidity levels, which causes a low pressure zone and therefore a low density altitude or air that's just a little bit thinner and slightly harder to take off in. And any stable conditions that you have in a low pressure zone aren't likely to last because you've got high pressure air that wants to flow to that low pressure area. A high pressure zone can last for a couple weeks. A low pressure zone typically lasts maybe a few days to a week. Our third type of front known as an occluded front is where one catches up to another. Generally speaking, the cold front is moving faster, so it's usually where a cold front overcomes a warm front, and now you've got warm air behind cool air. With the occluded fronts, you've got these two air masses staying together for a longer period of time instead of one pushing the other out of the way. Now you've got these two air masses mixing and creating a lot of inclement weather, very unpredictable winds, and all around very rough flying conditions for sometimes days at a time after the front passes. Lastly, our stationary front just refers to the Mexican standoff happening between a cold and warm air mass. In this situation, you'll have winds moving along the front, but in opposing directions. Unfortunately, in these situations, all you can really do is wait, maybe get the betting rounds going as to which one's gonna overcome which. My money is personally on the cold front. But with this newfound knowledge of fronts, let's go ahead and check out some meteorolo meteorolo meteorological sites that you can use to better understand where these fronts are heading, when they're gonna get there, and when to plan that trip out to Moab. We're gonna start off with weather.gov, which has data driven from NOAA, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And on this site, we've got this little map here, the national forecast chart. So I'm gonna just go ahead and click on this guy, and it will pull up with a bigger image, if I scroll down here to weather map, I'll click on this guy, and it should pop up a bigger image of the whole United States, where the high pressure zones are, where the low pressure zones are, and where the precipitation is, as well as my fronts. The triangles point in the direction that this front is going. So from west to east, with it looks like where I am here, we've got snow predicted tonight or tomorrow, and I can see that right here in this white. So we're looking to go to Moab, correct? Let's go ahead and look at that location. It's right in here somewhere. So this cold front is going to be hitting it fairly soon. Let's look at tomorrow's forecast. If I click here, we can see how that really is predicted to pan out. With all this low pressure hanging out, guys, it's likely going to be very wet. And we can see that the white shapes here our snowfall. So let's check Friday. We've heard of Friday, see how it pans out. It looks like it starts to clear up actually. That front tends to move through and a high pressure zone starts to move in, which is a good thing. So from Thursday to Friday, yeah, it looks like this weekend could actually be promising with this high pressure zone. It looks like precipitation tends to stay away starting Friday but we'd probably wanna check it again tomorrow if we are making this trip this weekend. So this is weather.gov and it is useful if you're looking at frontal forecasts in the next few days. It's gonna give you a projection as to what could be happening based on certain weather models. Now I wanna move over to a site known as Meteo Blue. And this is actually a real-time view of the cloud cover over the United States, which is pretty cool. And there are a lot of cool features to this free site. 
So over on the right here, I can switch between different radar types. So this is a wind radar. The yellow is where I've got stronger gusts and the light blue is where I've got little to no wind. And if I zoom in on my desired location here, looks like I do have quite a bit of wind going on right now. But if we go down to the bottom of the screen, you can actually filter through the different days. Again, now we're into projections, of course, but if I go to Saturday morning here, it's right around my flying window. Looks like it's very calm. Looks like it could be a good time and place to fly Moab. The other thing I can do is I can check out the cloud and precipitation level. Looks like there's very little cloud cover, very light precipitation on the morning of Saturday. If I go to temperature, I can check out the different temperatures. And I can check out wind gusts, the lighter blue. The more blue the color, the more steady the winds are or closest to the steady state. So it looks like I've got very minimal gusts going on three to five miles per hour, as you can see, as I toggle over the different colors, right within our threshold. <laughs> so one of my favorite things about this site is the weather archive. So it actually allows you to see the previous year as well as this year's entire weather history. If I go over here to history and climate, it'll drop down a menu and I'm gonna find that weather archive menu. And at this point, you wanna select the previous year, which will allow you to see all of the data throughout the course of the year. And you can kind of extrapolate this data to say, okay, what time is gonna be best for me to fly? Okay, so I've got the two years that I can compare between. We wanna make sure that our time range, if we're looking at the best time of year to fly, that we have this one year button toggled on and that will give us an idea of all of the weather, max and min temperatures, precipitation in inches, and wind speed throughout the entire year. So looking at this chart, on the x-axis we've got wind speed, the time of year on the y, and also these little purple dots indicate wind direction, which I'm not necessarily terribly concerned with. I'm really looking at the wind speed. So it looks like starting in July, the wind speeds really start to taper down and get very constant and even. That these two different lines, this is my, my base wind speed on the bottom, this is my wind gust on the top, I wanna make sure that those two lines are as close together as possible for a nice smooth flight around that jagged terrain. Looks like from July to really August is best time to plan my trip to Utah. So this is what I'm gonna shoot for. Let's look at 2022 just out of curiosity to see how regular this data is. And I can confirm that from July to August and even all the way through October would be a good time to plan my trip. So I know that July, given the fact that 2022 and 2021 align in July, I can probably bet that in next year, if I were to plan my trip, starting in July, it would most likely bear some flyable fruit. So who's meeting me there? We can also check precipitation. It's very low from July to September this year. Temperatures were nice and high and comfortable. So uh, yeah, sounds like a good time to me. You can check the past history up here as well if you wanted to double check, but you do have to pay for these different years of data. So this concludes what I know about weather. I really hope it helps improve your flying judgment. I am curious to know, however, what do you know about weather? How do you choose your flyable days from the not so flyable days? Leave a comment down below. I would love to know what you know so that we can grow together. That's it for me. If you're still watching this video, you're an absolute legend. And you might check out this video right here to improve your weather balloon skills via hand kiting. This is Lifted PPG. My name is Micah Stevens. Don't forget to take that deep breath and we'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers.